Hello friend, I'm Marcus here with the IndieMusicLab.com. So recently, I had the opportunity to analyze a song that was mixed in the incredible Dean Street Studios in the Soho District of London. This is the same studio, by the way, that legends like David Bowie and the great producer Tony Visconti used to work out of. Now, how did I get access to this mix, you might ask? Well, I was in London last year, and one of the friends I made while I was there was a really good dude named David. And David, whose artist's name is Rose, Land just released his first single and it is fire. Listen to this. From your water and into life, the silence of behind the eyes. So, thanks to my friend David and his producer Charlie Russell's generosity, I have the mix stems for this song right here. And in this video, I'm gonna share five things that I learned from analyzing this mix. Now, I don't wanna skip over any credits that are deserved on this song, so I do wanna mention that this song was recorded in Fish Factory Studios in London, and the recording engineer was Simone Galazio. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And then, as I already mentioned, this song was mixed in the incredible Dean Street Studios. All right, that's enough for the intro. Let's go ahead and dive in. These are the five things I learned while analyzing this mix from Roseland. So the first thing I want to mention here when it comes to my takeaway from this mix is I was reminded of how important it is to just serve the damn song. Now, when you think of songs that have been professionally recorded and mixed in studios with thousands of dollars of high quality gear and preamps and $3,000, $10,000 microphones, all that good stuff. When you imagine songs that are made in those types of settings, you and I as humble home studio owners, we, I think, sometimes presume that when a song gets done in that environment, that it has to come out sounding super extravagant and sounding super elaborate. But often, that's not the case at all. And the reason that's not the case is because that's not what's important. What's important is that every piece of the puzzle fits and serves the identity of the song at large. Well, deep sea diver, what did you find? And look, this mix, if I counted right, is a 32-track mix. And that includes all the individual drum tracks, as well as the guitar doubles and the vocal doubles. 32 tracks. That's not that many tracks especially when you think about a song that is made so professionally like this one was. But trust me, if this song had 150 tracks, it would not sound better. It would probably sound worse. So underneath every song that we record and mix, there needs to be this philosophy. Serve the song. Don't get in the way. Don't overprocess. Just give the song what it is asking of you. And just talking about this reminds me of that Rick Rubin quote that's been going around of late. It's all an offering to God. So everything in this mix, from David's vocal performance to the guitars to the drums to the mix and every other step, the editing, everything that was done in the process of making this song and taking it from start to finish, that entire offering, so to speak, is there to serve the overall identity of what this song is. And when I listen to this song, I feel like at least a couple characteristics of the core identity of this song is warm, ambient, and introspective. Those were three descriptive words that at least came to mind for me. And I think that makes sense because when you look at how this song is constructed, everything is in service of that, you could say, ideal. Everything is in service of creating a warm, ambient, and introspective song. So when folks like you and me are in our bedroom, in our home studio, working on our mixes, we need to remember this reality. It's all about the song. And we need to serve the song, not take it too far, not do too much, not do too little either. There's a balance and it takes obviously lots of practice and repetition to find that balance. But we always need to be cognizant of this. At the end of the day, just serve the damn song. Where's the ocean of all she knows? And in her answers. 
Now, the second thing I want to share with you that I learned from analyzing this mix here from Rosalind is that an authentic vocal take is so much more important than you might say a noiseless vocal take. So here's what I mean. I'm going to grab my headphones here and I want to show you. Let me show you David's vocal on this. Let me bring this back up to where the tracks are a bit normal size. There we go. So here is the lead vocal. Listen to this. Uh, what did you find in those dark waters? What do you notice about this track? He's playing his acoustic guitar at the same time. The truth that we need to come to grips with here is that the quality and the authenticity of a vocal take is much more important than, say, recording it in a perfect, you know, studio space or a closet that has perfect, completely dead, no outside noise, nothing else going on, just the vocal. Yeah, that's not as important. It's way more important to get a vocal that sounds amazing, that sounds authentic, like David's vocal is here. And it's okay if there's a guitar that is underneath that, that is bleeding through. That's not the worst thing in the world. You might even argue that it helps give this song more of an authentic feel and a little bit less of a polished feel. Because that guitar track that you hear that's bleeding through, it really is just a scratch guitar track because they recorded a whole new guitar track to be the main guitar sound. And so when you put that together, let's come back here. Did you ask the ocean of all she knows? Phenomenal work by David on this vocal take. I absolutely love it, seriously. So here's the big takeaway. Do whatever it takes to get the most authentic and to get the most believable vocal recording you can. And if you need to record that vocal with an acoustic guitar playing, or if you need to hang upside down from the ceiling or sit down in a meditative position like this with your legs crossed, whatever you gotta do, do what you gotta do to get the best vocal take. So there you go. Authenticity and authentic vocal take is always more important than a noiseless vocal take. Oh, and by the way, before we get to the last three, I want to mention this as often as possible, but guys, be sure to go follow my friend Rosalind on Instagram. Go listen to him on Spotify. Follow him on Spotify as well. Give him as much algorithmic help as he can get because he is going to be big. I just, I have a feeling he's going to be, he's just going to keep growing and I'm so excited to watch it and I'm here for it. So be sure to go show him some love. All right. Now, the third thing I observed when I analyzed this mix is I found it really refreshing at the minimalism and the simplicity of the reverb approach on this song. So as you can hear, it's a pretty ambient song, right? The silence of behind the it's got a really cool ambient vibe to it. But the reverb approach is, again, it's so minimal and so simple. What they did here is basically they used one plate reverb as the bass line, as the core reverb sound in the song. And so I have that since I just have the mixed stems here. I actually have this uh, plate reverb, and this is the return track or the send, as you might say, where multiple tracks are being sent through this return track. And so this is what the plate reverb sounds like. And so you can hear some drums going through it. I actually think that's coming from that vocal though, but it's got vocals being sent through it, guitars, especially over here. Yeah, so you got some guitar, some drums going through that, vocals going through that. And that's just one reverb. And they're sending a bunch of things through that reverb to create the core reverb sound. It's just a plate reverb. And then what the producer, and I believe he mixed the song too, Charlie Russell did on this mix is whenever there was an individual track that needed or where he wanted to get a more specific reverb sound, he would just put the reverb directly onto that track. And so to give you an example of that, the best example is probably 
these electric guitars. So you've got this part here. Sounds so good. Right, so that sound. So that is its own track, has its own reverb. And then when we come over here, there's this guitar track too. Again, it's its own, it's a much bigger reverb. And then to give you one more example, we've got on the background vocals, on the doubles here, these also have their own reverbs. The silence of you behind there. And then that layers in with the lead. And so I really like the way they approach the reverb on this song. It's so minimalistic and everything just, it's so neat and tidy and it just makes sense. Just have one core reverb. That's what they did here with the plate. And then any other time that you want a more specific reverb sound, just put it directly on the track and you're good to go. All right, now the fourth thing I learned when I was analyzing this mix is that I was reminded really of this reality that when you get your drums right, your life just gets 10 times easier. I want you to listen to how good these drums sound. Let me come over here to the biggest part of the song where you can hear most of them. And then if we come over here, Now, you might be asking, okay, Marcus, but I don't have the space, I don't have a drum kit, I can't mic up my own drum sound and get this exact type of sound. And okay, that's fair. It might not sound quite this good when you use VSTs, like Addictive Drums or Easy Drummer, but what I wanna encourage you with is you can actually make those sound better than you think. And as an Addictive Drums user, that's what I use. I also don't have a professional studio. I don't have the room right now. Maybe one day when I'm really rich, I'll be able to hopefully have a really nice badass studio with my own drum kit and I can make them sound just like this by recording them. But for right now, I have to work with what I have. And so I use addictive drums. But the point underneath that, what I'm trying to really get at here is we need to understand the value of getting the drum sound right. And it doesn't necessarily matter if that is drums that you recorded live like this, or if it's from a piece of software, or if it's even a drum loop. What matters most at the end of the day is that the drum sound serves the song and that it serves the song well. And so perhaps on your next mix and on my next mix, I wanna include myself in here, we should probably spend a little bit more time making sure that our drum sound is awesome, that it's locked in, that it sounds the way it's supposed to, that it sounds really good. Because when it does sound really good, again, your life just gets 10 times easier when it comes to mixing it, when it comes to gluing the whole song together. There's nothing worse than trying to make a crappy drum sound or a, a drum sound that just doesn't mesh with everything else, trying to make that work in a mix is such a pain. And so when you can get the drum sound right, everything else gets easier. And again, these drums sound phenomenal. Oh, and there's one more thing I wanna point out here about these drums. I want you to notice how much value the tambourine tracks in this mix have. So I'm gonna turn the tambourines off and on, listen to what it's like without and then with. I honestly think tambourines are one of the best kept secrets of drum recording. And I think this is a great example of that. It really doesn't take much. A little bit of a tambourine can just elevate a drum performance so much more when you just 
integrate a little bit of tambourine into it. All right, there's one more thing that I learned from this mix that I want to share with you. Now, before I do that, I quickly want to mention that I do have my free guide, The Seven Steps to a Killer Indie Song. If you're trying to make indie music and become the best indie artist possible, then be sure to go check this out. It's 100% free. I'll leave a link in the description. Now let's move on to number five. So the number five thing I learned from analyzing this mix is this. Take the story that exists in the recording and enhance it through mixing. As I was going through this mix, one of the thoughts I had is that a mixing engineer, when you are in a mixing in the mixing phase, it really is a lot like a film editor. You take the scenes that are given to you, and then your job is not to go in and muck everything up. Your job is to enhance it, bring out the best in it, and to delete the fluff and all the extra stuff or the extra scenes and the unnecessary components that don't need to be there. And the reason I bring this up is because I want to share this little thought with you here. The reason this mix is so well done, or part of the reason it's so well done, is because David and the recording engineer, I forget his name. What was, what was the guy's name? Simone Galazio, I think. Again, I might be saying it wrong, so I apologize. But everything inside of this song was done really well before it ever got to the mixing phase. Everything from the songwriting to the recording to David's vocal, which just sounds killer, to then really all the other instruments and everything else in some ways serving that vocal because the, the vocal, of course, is the focal point of this song. And so you and me in our bedroom studios, in our home studios, we cannot afford to be haphazard with our recordings and with our approach to the arrangement and the songwriting and then expect the mix to take care of everything. That is not how the process, that is not how the process works of creating a great song. You need to get it sounding amazing before it ever hits the mixing phase. You need the scenes to go back to the film editor analogy. You need the scenes to be really good before it gets in the hands of the editor. And only then will the editor truly do a phenomenal job is if the scenes and the story of that film are already good to begin with. So to recap this video, five things I learned from analyzing my friend Rosalind's mix on his song Deep Sea Diver. Number one was just serve the damn song. Number two was an authentic vocal take is much more important than a noiseless vocal take. Number three is the ultra simple reverb approach where you have one core reverb and then if you need a different sounding reverb for anything else, you can just add that directly to that individual track. Number four, when you get the drums right, your life gets 10 times easier. And finally, number five, take the story that exists in the recording and then enhance it through mixing. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, if you want to dive deeper into learning how to become a great indie artist and producer, then go check out my free guide, The 7 Steps to a Killer Indie Song. I will leave a link to that in the description below. And of course, as I've mentioned, go follow Roseland on Instagram. Go follow him on Spotify. Go listen to his songs. Show him some love. I can't wait to watch him continue to grow in the months and years to come. And of course, thank you so much to David and Charlie Russell and everybody involved in the creation of this song. And thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to dive into it and to analyze it. I really do appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. So once again, thank you to everyone involved. I'll see you in the next video.